So we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit this evening, verses 22 and 23. That's one pleasure I look forward to each year, actually. As it happens, we've had some strawberries in our garden this year, but normally we don't have too many. Uh, but this year we've had some strawberries and we've enjoyed quite a, a good crop. We're not, I'm not good at gardening, but I do enjoy fruit picking. I do enjoy particularly picking wild fruit in the late summer. Blackberries, um, apples, plums even. Um, have my favourite spots that are particularly good. If you want to know where they are, I shall let you know if you come and ask afterwards. And I love it when there's an abundant crop. You know, that I have my favourite spots and, and year by year they, they, they don't fail, mostly. Uh, and and they, they have some big, juicy, great blackberries and all sorts there. So, But some years I do turn up. Some years I go to my favourite plum spot and there's just nothing at all. Nothing. No fruit whatsoever. There's a theme that runs across the whole Bible, which is this, that God is a gardener looking for fruit from his people. Looking for fruit such as is listed in verses 22 and 23. And what both halves of the Bible teach is that only in Christ is this fruitfulness found. It's really what the Old Testament demonstrated, laid bare, was that there's no fruitfulness in human, fallen human nature. There's no fruitfulness apart from Christ. And so it looks forward to that. And the New Testament confirms that, that only in Christ himself and through him to those united to him by faith is there fruitfulness for God, such as we have listed in these nine things listed in verses 22 and 23. So my aim in this sermon is to cause us to look up to the Lord Jesus Christ for our bearing of this fruit to increase, which we then live out in our lives. And that's surely Paul's aim himself in writing this, in this letter. He hints at the meagerness of this good fruit amongst the Galatian churches that he's writing to. Look at verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It seems he's hinting at the problems that were amongst his readership here, that they were not very fruitful, not producing a a whole load of good fruit like they should have been. Now, what would be the way of putting that right? What would be be Paul's answer to that? Try harder? No, of course not. That's hardly in keeping with the tenor and gist and theme of this whole letter to the Galatians. The fruit are of the Spirit, not of ourselves. And so we need to look up out of ourselves to the Spirit of Jesus to produce this fruit. And so Paul in this letter urges his readers, just as they began in the Spirit, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, so now continue in the Spirit. Continue following Paul's own example, living by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, chapter 2, verse 20. Now, I wasn't particularly looking forward to preaching this passage. I thought, how can I preach this? I just feel so fruitless in my own life. I, I just feel a bit of a failure in this regard. But if I'm preaching the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and urging us all, including myself, to look up to him, then I, I feel like, yes, I can preach that to us. I'm preaching that to myself. That's where fruitfulness is found. So my title then is simple, The Fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to look at three things. Fruitfulness from Christ, fruitfulness in Christ, and fruitfulness for Christ. Firstly, firstly, fruitfulness can only come from Christ. I love it when I'm preparing for a sermon and I discover new things that I hadn't discovered before. And that's the case this week as I looked at Hosea chapter 14. So just turn there with me, please. It's on page 759. This is the last chapter of Hosea. Quite a a grim uh, ministry that Hosea had. Having to marry a wife of unfaithfulness, mirroring God, marrying an unfaithful wife in Israel. But look at this last chapter and particularly look at verses 4 to 8. It says this, God speaking, I I will heal their apostasy. 
I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who look. It is, it is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Just see the language of fruitfulness there. Like the lily, like the trees of Lebanon, like the olive, like the fragrance, like Lebanon, like the grain, like the vine, like an evergreen c- c- cypress. And it finishes the uh, well. I, where I stopped anyway. Verse eight. From me comes your fruit. This comes at the end of this book of prophecy where Old Testament Israel had manifestly failed to produce the fruit that God is looking for. They've been faithless, like, a, like, like this unfaithful wife that Hosea had to marry. Israel's repeatedly referred to as Ephraim here. Ephraim means fruitful. You can see that in Genesis chapter 41, verse 52. How will Ephraim live up to their name? How will fruitful live up to their name? Well, it's from the Lord. From me comes your fruit. And so this book looks forward to the new covenant, looks forward to a future when Israel would return to the Lord, verses 1 to 3, and from him produce good fruit. Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. This is on page 569. I've read this not too long ago. You may remember it. A classic passage on uh, the nation of Israel being uh, portrayed as a vine. I'll read verses 1, 2, and 7. On page 5, 6, 9. Isaiah the prophet says this, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Or as the commentator Alec Matea translates it, it, but it yielded stink fruit. Verse 7, what is this rotten fruit that they produced instead of the good fruit God was looking for? Verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. See how the Lord looked for fruit here amongst his people, but found rotten, stinking, the opposite of what he's looking for. But then look on to chapter 11 of Isaiah. Page 901. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. That means make judgments for the poor on their behalf and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. See, there is one here then who is going to bear fruit for the Lord. This one who comes from the shoot, from the stump of Jesse, this cut down royal line of David that had been cut down by the exile. There comes this shoot, this messianic shoot who will bear fruit for the Lord. And of course, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it just so resonates with the sorts of things that we looked at this morning, the the spirit of the Lord being upon him and so on. How are we going to then produce fruit for the Lord if the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who will produce fruit? Well, the answer is in John chapter 15. Turn there with me. John 15. Page 901. 
Apologies if I gave the wrong page number before. I don't know if I did. Anyway, page 901 for this one. John 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus talking, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That verse 5 is key. Abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing, says Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Those are the unfruitful branches. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So it's so clear there, especially verse 5. Apart from Jesus and abiding in him, we can do nothing. That's where our fruitfulness will come from. We can't produce fruit for ourselves uh, by ourselves that glorifies and pleases God. He's looking for that fruit, and it's only in the branches that abide in Christ and that have that sap, that life of the Holy Spirit from Christ in us, that we will produce the fruits of the Spirit. And so Jesus is the fruitful vine. There's no fruitfulness apart from in him. Without him, we're just dead, useless sticks, fit only, notice, for the fire. Now, bringing this all over then to Galatians chapter 5, this impresses on us that it's only from Christ, united to him, grafted into Christ by repentance and faith, that we can produce the fruit that God is looking for, and he is looking for fruit in our lives. So love, joy, peace, and so on cannot be produced except by the Spirit of God. Hence why they're called the fruit of the Spirit. Because they are of the Spirit, not of us. And they come by the Spirit in those who belong to Christ. Now this might seem an arrogant thing to say, that these fruit of the Spirit can only be in those who are grafted into Christ, those who are true born-again believers. You might feel arrogant. We might think, well, what about all the non-believers You know, people who are in caring roles, maybe caring for their loved ones or caring professions or that sort of thing. Is there no kindness there, for example? Well, the doctrine of total depravity does not mean that people are as bad as they could be, and that is a good thing for which we thank God. It means that our human nature is is thoroughly uh, tainted and corrupted by sin, but it doesn't mean we're each as bad as we could be, no which is a good thing. That's God's common grace, a blessing we can be thankful to God for. But the point is this. Though we may be glad that people are kind, people in the supermarket or wherever it is, are kind to us or let us out in the street, you know, we're trying to drive along. We might be glad that people are kind to us, but we need to know that God does not regard the love and kindness that is apparent in an unbeliever as good fruit. He doesn't. He doesn't regard that as good fruit. It comes from a hard heart. It comes from a heart that is hard towards God, not tender towards God. The only heart that is tender towards God is a new heart, a a born-again heart that recognizes its sinfulness. Now, rather than make believers arrogant, this humbles us because it tells us it's not of ourselves that any fruit pleasing to God comes. It's purely from Christ and the Spirit of Christ in us. Zero credit goes to us, no boasting. And in fact, it's amazing that God regards any of a believer's deeds as good fruit, as pleasing to him, because I know that my best actions, and if you're honest, you probably know that your best actions are tainted. We need the blood of Christ to be sprinkled on our best deeds. 
to cleanse us from the sin that mingles even with those sins. But we have that. We have Christ's blood through faith in him. And it cleanses our deeds and even somehow makes them acceptable to God and even pleasing to God. But as regards the production of fruit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, without Christ, in God's sight, that is impossible. Completely impossible. So let me just speak to anyone listening who is outside Christ, in other words, who's never yet fled to Christ. And I think it is so important we always think of faith in Christ as fleeing to Christ, because so many people think they believe in Christ without having fled to him from the wretchedness of their sin and from the judgment of God that's coming. So if you've never done that, if you've never fled to Christ, let me urge you, lovingly and tenderly, let me urge you to, to see yourself as Christ describes you, which is as a dry, fruitless branch that can never, ever produce the fruit that God's looking for in us. And God has no purpose with such a branch other than what any gardener would do with such a branch, which is to get rid of it. So let me urge you, if you've never come to Christ, never fled to Christ, to do that, to come and be grafted into the one place of fruitfulness, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way we can be fruitful for God and produce works and deeds that are pleasing to God. And so confess to God your complete inability to produce any fruit from yourself, just as I cannot produce any good fruit for God from myself, nor can any of us. And in deep repentance and faith, plead to be saved through being grafted into Christ. Now, secondly, I want to look at fruitfulness in Christ. And here here I'm speaking to believers. I'm speaking more about the things that are listed back in Galatians chapter 5. So back in Galatians chapter 5, just have a little look through that list there. And you see, first of all, note how many of them are one another things. Things that you cannot do in glorious isolation on a little desert island by yourself. You can't do them by yourself. Well, certainly love is in that category. Uh, We can love God, but love is bigger than that. The fruit that's required of us. Love for one another. Uh, Peace. This is surely talking about more than peace with God. This is talking about peace amongst ourselves as well. The peace of the church. Patience. Kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Probably others as well we can't do in in isolation. Now, I just want to make this point. This has a major application for us post-lockdown. Because so many Christians have got used to online church. And you might want to sort of put scare quotes around that, online church. How can the one another fruit of the Spirit be produced if we're we're not together, if we're not one anothering, if we're just sort of by ourselves at home, not meeting together regularly. And so it's vital that we are meeting together as a body. That's more important than cherry-picking our favourite online preachers. So by all means, listen to good online material, but not as a substitute for Sunday gathered worship. And maybe I should be staring down that camera right now. Because probably they're the people that need to hear this. Secondly, though, notice that the singular fruit is used in this phrase, fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, the fruit singular of the Spirit. Have you ever noticed that before? I hadn't noticed that before, or else I've I've forgotten. I'm not sure which it is. So what's the significance of that? Well, this is not about the cultivation of a plurality of certain virtues, But it's about the Spirit of Christ in us manifesting his fruit in different ways according to different circumstances. So when someone does something irritating, then the fruit of the Spirit is patience with that person. When there's conflict brewing, the fruit of the Spirit is being a peacemaker in that situation. When there's a need that we encounter that someone has, then the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. When there are commitments to keep, 
then the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And so it goes on. Now, it's surely no coincidence that the first mentioned of the list of nine is love. And you can see that many of them come under the umbrella of love. I mean, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, um, gentleness. They, they, they definitely overlap and maybe more than overlap. Now, we saw this morning that triune love undergirds everything. It undergirds creation, undergirds redemption, it undergirds heaven, it even undergirds hell. And so loving others as Christ loved us first is fundamental. We love because he first loved us. We're to go and do likewise. He washes our feet, so to speak, certainly literally the disciples in John 13, and he told them to go and do the same amongst ourselves. Now there are two aspects to love, and we need both of them. And the first is that love results in practical action and the second is that love needs to come from a truly loving heart for it truly to be love the need for practical action we we see this in james 2 16 it's no good saying to someone who's who's in need you know well go just go your way be warmed and filled without actually doing something to help them to be warmed and filled and so we're called to meet practical needs and produce that fruit in actual concrete deeds and and including basic menial sort of tasks as well and of course that's what jesus did for us when he went to the cross but then loving deeds also need to be done from the heart not grudgingly not with bitter evil thoughts 1 corinthians 13 think how even giving our body to the flames is just a, a sort of clanging noise if it's done without a true heart of love So deeds themselves are not sufficient. We need deeds and a true heart of love. And of course that means that the Lord Jesus went to the cross full of tenderness, full of a heart of love truly to save his people. And as I think about these things, I certainly feel my frequent failures. A bit like Paul in Romans 7, wretched man that I am. I may do good things, but is my heart truly loving? Is my heart truly in it? Am I grumbling as I do them? And all too often the answer is, I'm afraid it is. What's the answer to this? What's the solution to this? The answer, I think, is sunshine. Elaine and I went on our 25th anniversary holiday a few years ago. The first port we called in at was Palermo in Sicily, where we bought an ice cream. But far better than that were the grapes that we bought in Palermo. I have never tasted the grapes uh, grapes like like those grapes that we bought in that that market there why were they so sweet because of the sunshine that just blazes down day after day on that place at the other end of our holiday we bought from wine from cyprus uh, some wine from cyprus and it, i have to confess it's the best wine i've ever tasted what was the secret of that cypriot wine well they explained to me on the bus tour as we were driving it's because of the sunshine on those grapes if our fruit is to be sweet and delightful and not done with grudgingness internally but actually god who sees the heart seeing um, true sweetness and delightfulness then we need to spend a long time in the sunshine just like those grapes had to in palermo and in cyprus In other words, we need to spend a long time in the sunshine of Christ's presence. The Father certainly is looking for fruit that is sweet and lovely and not sour and nasty and makes your lips just sort of wrinkle up. He's not looking for that sort of fruit at all, just like we're not. And you know, it speaks about immature fruit in Luke's telling of the parable of the sower. You don't need to look there now, but if you want to look later, it's Luke chapter 8, verse 14. We find there that the seed that fell among thorns, Jesus says, their fruit does not mature. It's a bit like unripe anything, really. It just sucks the life out of you. It's horrible. The Father's not looking for that sort of fruit. 
He's looking for ripe fruit, just like you and I are if we go to the hedgerows in late summer. How will our fruit ripen? Well, it's by plenty of the sunshine of our Saviour. It's by spending time in his presence, in the word of God and in prayer. What will choke the ripening process? Well, Luke 8 verse 14 tells us. It's the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And so if we let these things choke our time spent with the Lord, we shouldn't be surprised if our fruit is somewhat sour. And I confess this is a challenge to me. Maybe it is to you too. And the way to put that right is not to let the cares and pleasures of life squeeze out time spent in the sunshine of Christ's presence. We need the sunshine for the fruit to be sweet. Thirdly, and very briefly, bearing fruit for Christ. Now let me just read here. I'm just basically going to read a quotation of something I stumbled across this week. Actually, as I was preparing for not this sermon, but this morning's sermon, but I stumbled across this and I thought, that's just relevant for this evening. So here it is. It's, a, it's John Owen. And I'm basically just going to read it and then a very short comment and we'll finish. It's John Owen commenting on a passage in the Song of Songs. And let me read it to you. This is about bearing fruit for Christ, okay? Christ will sup with believers, will dine with believers. By that revelation, I will come and eat with you. He refreshes himself with his own graces in them by his Spirit bestowed on them. The Lord Christ is exceedingly delighted in tasting of the sweet fruits of the Spirit in the saints. Hence it is that the prayer of the bride in Song of Solomon, that she may have something for his enjoyment when he comes to her. Song of Solomon 4 verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Which then Owen paraphrases like this. Oh, that the breathings and workings of the Spirit of all grace might stir up all his gifts and graces in me, so that the Lord Jesus, the beloved of my soul, may have meet and acceptable enjoyment from me. Our destiny is to sup with Christ, to dine with him. And it's the desire of the beloved in the Song of Solomon to have something for her lover's enjoyment when he comes to her. And so, yes, how we need to grow in the graces and fragrances of the fruit of the Spirit in order to be a fit bride for our Saviour. A bit like we thought this morning, that bride arrayed in these resplendent robes, gold of Ophir, gold interwoven, multicoloured fabric, beautiful, beautifully adorned. There's some fruit of the Spirit there, surely. And so how we need to be seeking and desiring earnestly for our fruit in our lives to be sweetened from all sourness and immaturity so that we're truly a reflection of Christ's image for him to delight in when he sucks with us. And so how much we need the Spirit to produce in us what will delight our Saviour with its beauty and fragrance. We can never produce that fruit by ourselves. Let that be written firmly in our minds we can never of ourselves produce this but we can by the spirit of christ in us so let's eagerly and zealously walk in the spirit and bear much fruit for christ our husband amen let's pray together